I'm not trying to apostolize to anybody, but I saw an angel, okay? It, there was snow in my house and there was no footprints. And all it said to me is, you need to go to Brighton Hospital. I was pretty lit at the time. I was willing <laughs> to do just about anything. But that doctor with the nanorobots, uh, he and I started talking and he was looking at my research and he was looking at other research that I showed him and he goes, man, you got something here. I want to talk really in depth with you about a couple things, your own story, obviously, but let's start with this obsession uh, with peppers, not just yours, but when did this happen? When did the country really latch onto this? Oh, and by the way, I watched episode two of We Are the Champions and I loved it on Netflix. And I think that that's going to play a, an even bigger role, I guess, in, in just getting this whole crazy world out into the mainstream. Yeah, it's really, really, it's the media that's catching up to the craze. The craze, uh, my take on it is that uh, when they opened the doors to immigration back in the late 80s, early 90s, and more of the uh, Asia Minor influence and the Southeast Asian influence in Africa and Central America and South America, you know, when we were growing up, uh, you know, exotic food was going to the Chinese restaurant down at the corner, right. okay? There wasn't a lot of different foods. So in the late 80s, early 90s, all these cultures came in and they brought with them their foods and they started opening restaurants. And people, okay, let, let's go try what a Thai restaurant is as opposed to, you know, Chinese. Uh, and that caught on really quick. People don't understand that like in 2004, hot sauce overtook ketchup, mustard, and mayonnaise as the number one condiment in the United States. Really? You know, 2006, it was salsa got into second place. Uh, the general public in America uh, caught on to this craze in the early 2000s. It wasn't until I got the Guinness record in 2013 uh, and an AP reporter did a story that went worldwide on it uh, that the rest of the media started catching on to this. Hey, we there's, there's something going on here. Uh, but... Li literally, literally, uh, and I, I'm quoting a study that Bonnie Plants did. Uh, they, they did a study of 50 million households in the United States because they wanted to see would reaper plants sell. Mm -hmm. uh, and 37.8 million of those households identified themselves as eating very spicy food. And over 32 million of them knew me by name. Okay, and this was in like uh, 2017, 2018. Uh, so the culture is out there. Uh, it's the media that is catching up to that culture. When did you know? When did you know the pepper would be the hinge upon which your life pivoted? And, and how did you get to the Reaper? Okay, well, I got to the Reaper by breeding a pepper. I got... Uh, Back when I lived in Detroit, uh, there was a, a doctor from Pakistan. He had been a royal Saudi doctor, and he had a place in Gross Point right on the water. It was beautiful. Uh, he used to bring me back peppers. Him and his kids would bring me back peppers from Pakistan, back when you weren't allowed to go to Pakistan. And I liked those peppers, so I kept those seeds and kept on growing them. And then a woman named Joan up at, uh, it was First Union at the time, she was from St. Vincent. And jo Joan kept on telling me, I don't know pepper, okay, because I bring her in peppers and hot sauce for her and her husband. And she bought me a pepper from St. Vincent off the volcano La Soferie. And I bred that pepper from La Soferie with, with nine other peppers, okay. That was the HP line, higher power line. Uh, we had a whole bunch of different things we were breeding in the back. That one happened to be HP. So uh, that's where the Reaper originated from. When I knew that it was something special, I did a, a contest called the Charlotte Ventures, okay? And I was like fourth in line to do my presentation. This was for $50,000 and we needed the money. You know, we needed the money at the time. And the first person who presented was a, a woman doctor. And she's, oh, I've got a staff of 400. We want to bring on two more researchers. I've come up with a uh, pinprick 
uh, test for a breast cancer that's 90% accurate, you know. And she talked a bunch of science. The next guy was a doctor who was using nanorobots to deliver chemotherapy into uh, cancer patients, targeting the cancer cells with 10% of the side effects of normal chemotherapy. And the next one was doing, <laughs> they were doing something with lung cancer. And so I got up and I said, I'm smoking egg curry. I invented the hottest pepper in the world, and I don't belong here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I got third place. Ha! <laughs> okay. <laughs> but that doctor with the nanorobots, uh, he and I started talking, and he was looking at my research, and he was looking at other research that I showed him, and he goes, man, you got something here. And I wasn't looking to get the hottest pepper in the world. It was testing as the hottest pepper in the world. Uh, but what people don't know is it's very high in a subcapsinoid that has a key on it that uh, when you get it to a cancer cell, it causes an autoimmune sequence that kills the cell. Uh, and it's missing another capsinoid that's prevalent in that species of pepper, uh, Ch Chinez peppers. So we have, we have something special here that the medical community is looking at. And we, you know, uh, not too far after that, a doctor from Sloan Kettering talked about the cancer research, and there was there was a lot of there was a lot of stuff going on in the background. I knew I had something because all these doctors were telling me I had something. Okay, mm -hmm. and I'm you know I'm no doctor. I've done a lot of a lot of, a lot of different things, and I know basic chemistry and basic botany and things like that. But these guys really let me know there was something special going on. Uh, I really didn't care about it being the hottest pepper in the world until people started challenging me on Facebook. And I didn't find out about it until they started challenging me uh, because I, don't, I never used Facebook really before that, you know, just taking pictures and stuff. But uh, it took four years to get the Guinness World Record, and then I knew I really had something special because people came at me from all over the world, you know. But it just seems like two totally different verticals, right? Like you're in the yeah. food business and you're building something that people like it because it tasted good and it makes their food interesting versus curing cancer. I well, mean, that's it. You know, the, the science, there's a lot of science, okay, that shows that natural things are better for you in challenging diseases uh, than the chemicals that they've come up with through the pharmaceutical industry. And I'm not degrading those at all because, like, my mother had lung cancer. She suffered for a long time. Uh, the medicine kept her alive, and that's what she wanted from it because she wanted to see her grandchildren. You know, so everything, everything has its place. I just think that uh, there are things out there. We used to cure disease with natural things before the 60s. And there is science that shows those things work. Uh, it's just now pushed aside by advertising. You need a pill instead of eating healthy. Uh, you, need, you need, you know, to buy this bottled water instead of drinking spring water. You need to, you know, different... It's it's about other. It's the greed. Remember, we talked about the greed factor. Uh, sure. Greed came into play in the mid '80s when people started making a lot of money in the financial institute. I was part of that. I I wanted big money for big drugs. Uh, so uh, the greed factor came in, and it wasn't about how can we help people. It's about how we can take advantage of people. And that has just proliferated until, you know, uh, the last few years, I've, a lot of businessmen that I know have started looking into how they can serve their customer base instead of how they can grow their customer base, how they can, you know, how they can serve their communities instead of how can I make money off of this. Uh, is, and there link, it, is there a link, Ed, between the, the, the potency of the peppers themselves, like the hotter they get, are the mm. doctors telling you that that's going to be the proximate cause of some new cure, essentially? Uh, yes, that, that is essentially it. Uh, and there, there's a doctor up, in, up at Sanford who, who is doing obesity studies with kids, okay? And he is using Carolina Reaper specifically because of the properties inside of Carolina Reaper 
in his regimen to get these kids from being morbidly obese back to a normal weight and stop producing yellow fat and start producing brown fat. Now, it's in conjunction with other things, uh, but though he specifically states that it's the compounds in the reaper that are accelerating this process. And I'm not, you know, I was like, I made a joke. I was like, okay, so they got chronic diarrhea, you know? <laughs> they, yeah, the pounds really food. come off. Yeah, the pounds come off. But it's not like that at all. It's, it's used medicinally uh, in very small doses to keep their metabolisms accelerated and to help switch that uh, sugar addiction. You know, it's, ju- it's just our brains wanting drugs, okay? The sugar is just like heroin is just like you know, pot or alcohol or whatever, is our brain craving that drug. And when you fill those receptors that are looking for that certain drug, that drug doesn't mean much anymore. The receptors are already filled. So it helps wean off of the addictive bad things and put it back in uh, good things like eating healthily. And, I, you know, I don't look like I eat healthy. I, I actually do, uh, with the exception of ice cream. I've actually, yeah, but once upon a time, Ed, once upon yeah. a time, if I remember right, you were tipping the scales at 360, 370, something like yeah. that. Yeah, 368 was, the high, was what I weighed when I went into treatment. Uh, I, I, st- I started drinking and doing drugs at a very young age. Pro- probably by 13, I was a full-blown addict. Uh, just could not live a day without it. Uh, and I did everything I could to get to get what I needed. Okay, from rob, robbing my parents' liquor cabinet to, you know, we used to do things back in the '70s. You could pimp liquor. You know, people, the, someone old enough would take five bucks from you and get you a pint of whatever, and they'd keep the change. That kind of thing. Sure. You know, but I had to, you know, sell drugs to get the money to get liquor and drugs. You know, and I just I spiraled down that. I was successful. You know. I went to college, did a whole bunch of other stuff, started the research on peppers, got jobs. I mean, I was successful at what I was doing. Uh, but in the background, I was drinking all day long every day and getting high all day long every day. And it got to a point where uh, there, was, there was no other goal, okay? Really, there was no other goal. I, everything I did was to get to that next fix, no matter what that fix was. Uh, and it, it really, it took me to a real dark place to the point where, uh, no one, you know, my family wasn't talking to me really, you know, I, my friends weren't talking to me unless they wanted to get high or drunk, you know, uh, I really, I, my wife had left me. I was really bad, you know, uh, but I decided, you know, I decided to kill myself one night, uh, and I was going to do that by drinking myself to death and doing as much cocaine as I could. Uh, I had forgotten that I had all this other dope in the house and that would have done it a whole lot faster <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, because I was so focused on what my mission was, you know. And uh, it was a blizzard in Michigan at the time. They would, they had, there was a shit ton of snow coming down. If you've ever been to Michigan in January, it's cold as hell. Mm, okay, it's cold. Just cold it's as cold. hell. And, and right? this is what, 20 years ago? Yeah, this was 90, or 90, yeah, 99, January of 99, uh, 24 years ago. 24 years. All right, go ahead. uh, I had opened the doors and windows to my little condo there, and I stripped naked, which had to be a sight to see, you know. Uh, You're 368 pounds, you're naked. I thought I was God's gift to women then, you know. (laughs) (laughs) The only reason any woman talked to me was to get high, you know. Uh, But... You know, I, I sat at the table and I literally started drinking myself to death. And at the time, I was pounding down about a gallon and a half of liquor a day. I mean, I had a, a serious that habit a going. Lot. Yeah, I, a I, lot I didn't eat things. for like a half a year. All I did was drink Slim Fast in vodka, you know. And that's what that was my nutrition. Uh, and, wow. you know, I'm not trying to apostolize to anybody, but I saw an angel, Okay. It, there was snow in my house, and there was no footprints, all right? And this angel... A literal told, angel. A literal, literal angel. It was an aberration, and I, I, it kind of freaked me out, you know? And, uh, this aberration told me to go to Brighton Hospital, 
And I was like, oh, okay, I'll go to Brighton Hospital. That sounds like a good idea. So at the time, I had two cars out there, and one was a Camaro RS T-top, okay? <laughs> and instead of taking the safe vehicle out into the blizzard, I loaded up the Camaro with alcohol and drugs and some clothes and guns, and I drove out into the blizzard to find Brighton Hospital. But, hold on, Ed. Know, hold sorry, on. Sorry. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, go if we're going to go there, I, I'm pretty sure I know what Chuck is going to ask, but I'm not. I'm not positive. But I mean, let's. We we can't gloss over the angel. Um, okay. <clears throat> uh, boy, girl, androgynous. It was, it was female. It was definitely female. Uh, it had boobs, you know. So, uh, and it was it was bright white. I mean, bright white. And it, it like had radiating a, light or light, like like light coming externally? Would, no, just lit up. I really can You know, it was kind of like backlighting, but forward lighting too. Okay, there was the light came through the door and there was this angel there. And the angel was whiter than the light behind it. Okay, and that's what I saw. And all it said to me is, you need to go to Brighton Hospital. And I was okay. <laughs> well, yeah. So, so my question is, my question is, so this this angel, and you know immediately it's an angel. It's some sort of. Uh, I had no idea it as what the hell it was. <laughs> okay. But you said I'm going to do with this whatever this is. is, is I was telling pretty. Me to do. I was pretty lit at the time. I was willing <laughs> to do just about anything. Okay. <laughs> And Did I, you feel in any distress at all, like you no, needed to go I, to the hospital? No, all that feeling I had inside of wanting to kill myself and all that, like, uh, fear and uh, and shame and guilt, uh, it just, boom. It went away. You need to go to Brighton Hospital now. <laughs> okay, Ed, let's pack. And I literally started packing. Uh it was it was an immediate thing. The thing disappeared. I looked for footprints because I thought, oh, wow, that was pretty cool. But there were no footprints, you know. And uh-huh. that was that, man. I would, Within 20 minutes, I was in the car. Did you feel sober suddenly in that moment? No, no. I, did. I, I was still high. I, I hadn't felt sober in probably 20 years, good 20 years. All right. Uh, but I don't know what normal is, and I don't know if there's any change. OK, uh, I didn't at the time. I only knew that I started shaking if I went more than an hour without drinking or getting high. You know, I knew I got sick if it got to two hours. You know, that's all I knew in life. Uh, Dude, this is an amazing. I mean, holy cow. Well, it's the truth. You know, I like, you know, my legal team doesn't like me talking about it, but it's the <laughs> truth. OK, and that's the, you know, I cannot deny the miracle that happened to me, all right? That's just it. So go on. So I get in the car, I go out in the Camaro in the snow, which is the brightest idea in the whole world, you know? Just in case I need the T-tops, you know? (laughs) I don't know what I was thinking. But I started driving around. I knew where Brighton, Michigan was, so I kind of figured Brighton Hospital was out there. It's not in any phone books, okay? Because at the time, Internet was, you know... (laughs) You saw the AOL things at uh, at the yeah. uh, grocery store, but there really was no internet, mm-hmm. and it wasn't on the internet that I had. Uh, I I started driving around Brighton. And I was like, oh, no, this is useless. And I went to a friend's house that was in the next town down, Wixom Lake, and they were like, what are you doing? And I said, oh, I saw an angel. I'm trying to get to Brighton Hospital. Uh, they were like, Ed, have a drink, you know, <laughs> calm down. And I was just too hyper for it. Uh, so. Overnight, they went to sleep because this was like two in the morning. And then the next morning, uh, they had talked with my family, told them what was going on and said, we know where the sign is for Brighton Hospital. And I got some liquor because I don't like going anywhere without having enough liquor with me. And we were getting high and stuff. And we get to Brighton Hospital and I knocked on the door and they said, what do you want? And I said, an angel sent me here, you know. And they were like, oh, come on in, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. We have an angel wing set up right over here. We get this here. all the time. Yeah, yeah sure. And, <laughs> and they sat me down, and they started talking about rehab. And I was like, oh, I'm in the wrong place. This isn't where the angel sent me, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I was immediately, hey, we got to get out of here, <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is not my part of my plan. And uh, they asked me if I had a problem, and I said, no, I don't have a problem with anything, you know. 
And Carl, who was with me, handed me a, a flask of Jack Daniels or Jim Beam. I honestly don't remember which. It was bourbon. Uh, you know, a pint, and I'd, I drank it down and put it down, kept on talking to them like nothing was going on. And they were like, maybe you want to sit here for a second while we talk, okay. And then some old guy came in who I later found out was like uh, one of the techs there, and he's trying to talk to me, and they're trying to fit, you know get me to fill out this thing. And I was like, okay, I'll stay the night, you know. And, and like five days later, I woke up when they were jabbing Fina Barb in my ass to keep me from convulsing. Uh, so wow. so yeah. how long were you there total? I stayed there for 33 days. I didn't want to leave, you know. Uh, my insurance at the time covered like two weeks. You know, I, I had that... Uh, that, <laughs> that uh, you know, Detroit area union insurance. Uh, you know, you got no, you got a two week best. vacation in the winter, two week vacation in the summer for substance abuse, but you couldn't do more than two weeks at a time. Uh, mm. So I I didn't even know my insurance was paying. I my attorney came. I said, you just write them whatever checks they need, and I stayed there until they told me I had to go, and then uh, you know then uh, I stayed there for another. 30, 32 months, 33 months in total. I didn't stay at the hospital that whole time, but I was in, uh, I stayed at a uh, place on a lake that was about a mile away. I thought I had lost my license. It turns out I never had lost my license. So I started walking back and forth to the hospital every day. Uh, How far? It was, you know, a mile and a half, two miles. Uh, So is that how you started to lose weight as well? Oh, yeah. Uh, by the time I left Brighton Hospital, I was down to 165 pounds, okay? Wow. Yeah, and, and <laughs> feeling pretty good about myself, you know? You right. lost 200 pounds. So, wait a minute. Yeah. Just to recap, you're, you're 368 pounds. You're at mm-hmm. the bottom of the barrel. Mm-hmm. You open up your condo. It's freezing cold. The snow blows in. You take off all your clothes, and you drink all the <laughs> liquor you can find. An angel comes tells you to go to Brighton Hospital, you go, you stay for 33 days, and then you come and go, walking back and forth to the hospital for another three years? Yeah, essentially, a little less than three years. You lose 200 pounds in mm-hmm. the course of this, and basically, when did you believe you had beaten your addiction, or do you believe you've beaten it, or do you I believe don't... you've just replaced it with, with capsaicin? Uh, I believe that God has relieved me of the uh, want or need for any mood-altering, mind-changing substance that might be illegal at this time or not illegal at this time. Uh, I have no desire to get high in any way, shape, or form. However, I would be remiss in not saying that I catch a pretty good buzz off of peppers and (laughs) caffeine, okay? Uh, one of the reasons I lost so much weight is because I pretty much lived on cigarettes and caffeine that whole time. 